world news tonight. Curbing the crisis. Strong-willed Bangladeshi scientists seek treatments to put an end to the fatal dinky outbreak. Ban. Nepal bans Chinese short video app TikTok, citing disruptions to social harmony. Unusual return. Ex-Prime Minister David Cameron returns to the UK government as foreign secretary. Cologne celebrations. Carnival season casts its spell over reveling partygoers in Cologne, Germany. This is Adha Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. A very good evening and you're joining us on World News. Tonight we begin with updates on the dengue outbreak in Bangladesh. Rising temperatures and longer monsoon is a region potentially caused by climate change are providing ideal breeding conditions for the dengue spreading mosquito as the country grapples with its worst ever outbreak of the viral disease. Kabirul Bashar, an entomologist and zoology professor at Jahangirnagar University in the capital Dhaka, has spent the good part of his career studying mosquitoes, hoping to find ways to prevent the spread of mosquito-borne diseases, including dengue fever. But out of his 25 years of research, he had never seen such a severe outbreak as that recorded in Bangladesh this year. Official data showed that the death toll from Bangladesh's worst dengue outbreak on record has topped 1,400 so far this year. With hospitals struggling to make space for patients as the disease spreads rapidly in densely populated country. At least 1,449 people have died so far in 2023 and nearly 290,000 infected. Making this the deadliest year since the first recorded epidemic in 2000. A total of 856 people died of dengue in the previous 23 years while this is the first time dengue was found in all of the 64 districts of the country. As authorities scramble to contain and treat the disease, which is also known as a breakbone fever for severe muscle and joint pains it induces. Bashar decided to intensify his research on the Aedes aegypti mosquito that spreads dengue. According to the professor, temperature, humidity and other components are changing patterns due to climate change. As he said, these seasonal pattern changes are creating the ideal situation for Aedes mosquito breeding. The professor said Aedes, a mosquito known for breeding in clean water and biting during daylight, are adapting to the situation and can reproduce in almost any type of water. His research also found that the mosquito bites during the night as well. The adaptation of the biting and breeding may be due to the climate change pressure. Accordingly, Bashar, who is also the only scientific expert sitting on the country's National Anti-Dengue Committee, suggests it would be impossible for the authorities to eradicate dengue or stop its spread unless a general public participates in the breeding source management. But he admits more research is needed to understand the reason behind the increasing case in rural areas, as Aedes aegypti mosquitoes are known to mainly breed in cities. On to Nepal, as the country says that it will ban TikTok, adding that social harmony and goodwill are being disturbed by misuse of the popular video sharing app and that there is a rising demand to control it. <laughs> Nepal's Minister for Communications and Information Technology, Rekha Sharma, said that the decision to ban TikTok was taken at a cabinet meeting yesterday. Sharma further stated that the decision was made because TikTok was consistently used to share content that disturbed social harmony, family structures and social relations. She said that authorities are working on closing it technically without specifically saying what triggered the ban. TikTok has already been either partially or completely banned by other countries, with many citing security concerns. More than 1,600 TikTok-related cybercrime cases have been registered over the last four years in Nepal, according to their media reports. TikTok did not immediately respond to a request with a comment on the matter. It has previously said such bans are misguided and that they are based on misconceptions. Moving on to Israel Hamas war updates. In some hopeful news, Hamas said that it is ready to release up to 70 hostages held in Gaza. This comes after they stated that they wouldn't strike a deal after attacks close to the Al-Shifa hospital. Hamas said on Monday that it is ready to release up to 70 women and children held in Gaza in return for a five-day truce with Israel. In a message on Hamas's official telegram channel, the group said the armistice should include a complete ceasefire and humanitarian aid for the Gaza Strip. This comes as Hamas closed any hostage deals after the Israeli operations close to the Al-Shifa medical complex in Gaza City 
left that hospital at breaking point with thousands of patients without electricity and water in need of other vital aid. Thousands had to flee as gunfire and bombings continued outside the compound. U.S. President Joe Biden called for a halt to attacks affecting medical facilities. And it's my hope and expectation that uh, there will be uh, less intrusive action relative to the hospital. Uh, we're in contact and we're with, uh, with the Israelis. Also, there is an effort to uh, uh, take this pause to deal with the release of prisoners. And that's being negotiated as well with the Qataris that are engaged. And uh, so I remain somewhat hopeful that the hospital must be protected. However, the Israeli prime minister has already said there will be no ceasefire or supply of fuel into Gaza until the release of more than 200 hostages. Meanwhile, the Israeli Defense Forces said they successfully took over the Palestinian Legislative Council building in Gaza, which has only served Hamas lawmakers. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant said Monday that Hamas had lost control over the Gaza Strip as residents no longer trust the Hamas government. Gallant said that Israel's action in Gaza continued to destroy Hamas infrastructure and kill Hamas commanders and that terrorists are heading south leading to success in the northern part of the Gaza Strip. An extraordinary achievement. Truly amazing. There are no words. This is neither an operation nor a round but a war to the end. It is important to me that you know this. This is not deep service, but from the heart and mind. Whether Israel will accept Hamas's ceasefire deal remains uncertain as fighting continues. Yet criticism will continue from organizations such as the WHO and the UN if attacks on the civilian facilities carry on. Next in the UK, former British Prime Minister David Cameron has made a surprise return to UK politics, this time as Rishi Sunak's new foreign secretary. Former UK Prime Minister David Cameron arrived back in Downing Street on Monday to take up a surprise new role as foreign minister and the new title of Baron. Cameron. Current leader Rishi Sunak shuffled his cabinet and handed a life peerage to Cameron, who stepped away from politics in 2016 after the Brexit vote to pull Britain out of the European Union. Are you getting set for telling the truth, Home Secretary? The PM's long-planned reset was finally triggered by the firing of Interior Minister Suella Braverman over her criticism of police, an act which threatened Sunak's own authority. The ruling but divided Conservative parties badly lagging the opposition Labour Party ahead of a general election expected next year. And the return of a beaming Cameron suggests Sunak might want to bring in more centrist, experienced hands rather than appease the right of his party, which supported Braverman. Opposition lawmakers described Cameron's return as an act of desperation. It may also awaken divisive debate over Brexit, which Cameron himself opposed before resigning after six years at the helm. But I do not think it would be right for me to try to be the captain that steers our country to its next destination. Since then, the UK has had a few captains in Downing Street. The latest was forced to act against his interior minister after she defied him last week by penning an unauthorised newspaper article. Braverman accused police of double standards at protests, suggesting they were tough on right-wing demonstrators, but easy on pro-Palestinian marchers. Critics said that inflamed tensions between a pro-Palestinian demonstration and a far-right counter-protest on Saturday, when hundreds of thousands took to the streets of London and nearly 150 people were arrested. I intend to do this job in the way that I feel uh, best protects the British people and our interests. James Cleverley, previously Foreign Minister, was appointed to replace Braverman. Her attention might now focus on preparing for a possible future race for leader of the party if next year's election goes against the Conservatives. Over in the U.S., Donald Trump Jr. raved about his father's real estate portfolio in his second time taking a stand in the former U.S. president's civil fraud trial. Donald Trump Jr. returned to the witness stand on Monday in his father's civil fraud trial in New York, this time to answer questions from his own lawyers. Don Jr., along with his father, brother Eric Trump, and their real estate empire, 
are accused of inflating the values of properties and other assets by billions of dollars to secure better deals with lenders and insurers. On the stand, Donald Trump Jr. spoke at length on the history and qualities of his father's properties as his lawyer walked him through a slideshow of the Trump portfolio in an apparent bid to show the high valuations were justified. He also talked about the, quote, sexiness of his father's real estate projects, saying they attracted licensing deals with other developers who wanted to emulate his style. Lawyers for New York Attorney General Letitia James's office objected to the line of questioning, but the judge disagreed. It's a disgrace that this is happening right now, but I think we'll make our points, we'll make our case, and we'll go on from there. The lawsuit by James seeks at least $250 million in damages, as well as restrictions that would effectively bar Trump and his two adult sons from New York's real estate industry. This is a case that should have never been brought. It's a case that should be dismissed immediately. Trump the frontrunner for the 2024 Republican presidential nomination, has already taken the stand and has denied wrongdoing. He accuses James, an elected Democrat, of political bias. The New York case is largely about damages, as the judge has already ruled that Trump and his company fraudulently inflated asset values. Trump, meanwhile, faces a slew of legal troubles as he campaigns to challenge Democratic President Joe Biden in the 2024 election though none have diminished his commanding lead over his Republican rival. We'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. <music> Moving on to Road to the White House. Ron DeSantis' campaign is moving three of its top officials to Iowa this week, a move that comes as the Florida governor is increasingly staking his hopes on a strong performance in the state's first in the nation GOP nominating contest. <laughs> Deputy campaign manager David Polanski said National Political Director Sam Cooper and Communications Director Andrew Romeo are among the DeSantis aides who will now work from Iowa through the caucus, according to a person familiar with the plan. As part of the wave, the DeSantis campaign has set up a headquarters in Urbandale, Iowa. DeSantis himself has devoted a major amount of his time to Iowa too, visiting 92 of the state's 99 counties according to his campaign. The governor is expected to visit the office this coming weekend. The campaign is also expected to open other satellite offices in the state in the run-up to the January caucus. DeSantis' elite super PAC Never Back Down has invested substantial resources in the state, hoping that a strong performance will catapult him into contention. <music> Meanwhile, on the sidelines of the APEC summit, the leaders of the US and China will sit down for the first time in a year, resuming military communication channels and the use of China's influence on Iran in the Israel-Hamas war are likely to be discussed. U.S. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping are expected to agree on the partial reopening of military-to-military -military communication channels during their meeting this week. Biden is set to request a move and Xi is poised to accept, given that senior Chinese military officials have also supported the idea as part of efforts to prevent miscalculations and reduce the risk of any inadvertent clashes. In a press briefing on Monday local time, the White House National Security Advisor also expressed hopes, saying China's dialogue on this issue has been constructive. Having our two militaries in communication is the way you reduce mistake, you avoid escalation, you manage competition so it doesn't veer into conflict. Earlier on Sunday, he also said that Biden seeks to re-establish these kinds of military ties with China so that there isn't any miscommunication. Beijing cut off military-to-military -military communications with Washington last year, after then-U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. Relations between the two countries escalated further in February, when the U.S. shot down a suspected Chinese spy balloon that flew over its territory. Meanwhile, the senior White House official also said Biden is likely to call on China to use its influence on Iran to not let the country take any actions that could worsen the situation in the Middle East amid the war between Israel and Hamas. So President Biden will make the point to President Xi that Iran acting in an escalatory, destabilizing way that undermines uh, stability across the broader Middle East is not in the interests of, of the PRC or of any other responsible country. 
And the PRC, of course, has a relationship with Iran, and it's capable, if it chooses to, of making those points directly to the Iranian government. His remarks come as the Biden administration sees China, a big buyer of Iranian oil, as having considerable leverage with Iran, which has been supporting Hamas and Hezbollah militants. As climate change creates increasingly unpredictable weather patterns, the centuries-old Japanese tradition of cormorant fishing is under threat, along with the economy developed around it. In Japan, cormorant fishing is seen as the ideal way of catching the Ayu River fish and has become a popular tourism spectacle. But fisherfolk there say the changing climate is shrinking their catch as they worry for the future of their centuries-old tradition. These Japanese fishermen are catching Ayu sweetfish using a traditional fishing practice called ukai. Each of these strings are leashed to a cormorant, who do the actual fishing. They're trained to heed the human fisher's commands. The seabirds catch the fish that are darting away from the flames, and the leash on their necks and bodies keeps them from swallowing the larger, sellable fish. The master fisherman then coaxes the birds to release the fish into a bucket. Yuichiro Adachi is one of just 48 people in Japan who still practice ukai, a ritual once common in Japan with a version also practiced in China. Once it gets dark, when the sun has gone down enough that you can't see the ground and the sweet fish are sleeping, you raise up a flame and start ukai fishing. When you do that, it surprises the sweet fish, so they start moving around trying to get away. That's how the cormorants get them. Adachi is the 18th generation of his family to be a master cormorant fisherman in the Oze township north of Nagoya. His family has long been a supplier of the sweet fish delicacy for Japan's imperial household. But times and the climate are changing. As the planet warms, weather patterns are becoming more unreliable. Heavier rains are making the once calm Nagara River more prone to flooding. And the 48-year-old fisherman says the problem is not just a change in water levels. In the past, there were only big boulders, but now they're small. The sand and gravel has increased, and along with that, the sweet fish have gotten smaller too. That's my feeling. Gifu University river engineering professor Morihiro Harada says the sand and gravel are coming from flood prevention works. Due to the warming of recent years, major flooding has become much more likely. So the managers of the river have rapidly increased the pace of river improvement works. The sweetfish like to eat algae attached to large rocks. But the rocks are being covered up with gravel and sand, so the sweetfish can't get to them. The changing climate is also hitting the ukai industry in Gifu City downriver from Oze, which has turned to tourism for more income. Fleets of boats allow visitors to eat and drink as they watch the master fishers and their birds. But the chairman of an economic development body known as Organ, Yusuke Kaba, said the unpredictable weather is causing a growing number of cancellations. He even recalled times when tour boats were washed all the way to the mouth of the Nagara River. To adapt to the challenges, his group is now trialing a more luxury viewing deck with trainee geishas and other traditional performers. But as the river temperature rises to a high of 30 degrees Celsius, or 86 Fahrenheit, which can delay the spawning period of the Ayu by a month, the future of the sweetfish and the 13th-century-old ukai tradition remains at the mercy of climate change. Moving on to Australia next. After suffering a major cyber attack which crippled operations, DP World is slowly getting back to business. Let's take a look. Several of Australia's biggest ports are back in operation after a cyber security incident. The breach had crippled container terminals in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane and Fremantle. They were forced to suspend cargo movements for three days. But on Monday, port company DP World Australia said operations had resumed that morning, though there would be disruptions over the coming days. The news was a relief for businesses, with the firm handling about 40% of the goods that flow in and out of the country. 
Speaking in Parliament, Home Affairs and Cyber Security Minister Claire O'Neill said such incidents were concerning. Uh, this afternoon, DP World announced that they are resuming operations at their facilities. Their expectation is that 5,000 containers will leave their ports today. Speaker, the incident at DP World is the latest in a string of cyber attacks which have shaken our country. Earlier this year, Australia set up an agency to coordinate the response to major hacks. On Monday, ministers released some details of new laws that would force companies to report ransomware demands and similar issues. DP World didn't say if it had received any demands during the latest incident. The company said it was investigating what happened. Welcome back. World Diabetes Day was observed today. For more on that story and more, let's take it on the world. World Diabetes Day is observed on November 14th each year to raise awareness about diabetes, its prevention and management. Officials say a massive fire that damaged the stress of an important freeway in Los Angeles was caused by arson. Hundreds protested near Spain's Socialist headquarters after Spain's Socialist Party submitted a legislative proposal to Parliament. Dozens of men and women soldiers surrendered to Indian police in the state of Mizoram a day after heavy clashes with anti hindu rebel fighters. Taiwan's election commission said that Terry Gu, the founder of Major Apple Supply, Foxconn, has collected enough signatures to qualify to run as an independent candidate. That is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We're leaving you tonight in Cologne, Germany, as thousands of German travelers kicked off the carnival season in the stronghold of Cologne. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.